Hey everybody, in this episode of Trek in Time, we're going to be talking about tearing up. That's right, <laughs> about Enterprise, episode 10 of season 3, Similitude, which dropped on November 19th, 2003. For anybody who doesn't know, and if you're listening to us, I'd be surprised by now that you don't know, but what we're doing here is we're looking at all of Star Trek in chronological order. We're also taking a look at what was going on in our world at the time of the original broadcast. So we are still in early days. We're looking at Star Trek Enterprise, which means we're looking at 2003. And who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I've written some sci-fi. I've written some stuff for kids, picture books, and middle grade novels. And with me is my brother, Matt. He's the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with, with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. So we've got the storytelling covered. We've got the science covered. In other words, we've got Star Trek covered. Matt, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? I'm doing okay. I'm looking forward to talking about this episode, which without getting into details at the beginning, I just want to get a sense of where this conversation might go. What did you think? Big picture about this episode thumbs up thumbs down thumbs up i really liked it and it's a very emotional episode i thought it was very good yeah what i agree i agree i i right out of the gate at the very beginning i'm i'm not a fan of the book ending structure we've talked about that previously yeah. um and i have some thoughts on that but other than that, once you get past that element, I felt like this felt almost like a perfect pairing with last week's episode where we talked last week about they tried really hard to make something very original Trek. Yes. And they succeeded, unfortunately, because the story they came up with, the Old West and all of that was just like, really? It felt very dated. It felt very, why? Yep. Whereas this is another old trope of Very original Trek. Star Trek. You take a yep. character and you and they get duplicated. Trek has done that. Sci-fi has done that for decades. And yet they did it in a way here that I was just like, wow, they really, really did some interesting and unique stuff with this. So I'm looking forward to talking about it. Yeah. Before we get into that, as usual, we like to start off with some comments about previous episodes. So, Matt, do you want to share some comments that you found in our comments, sure. which is where our comments live? Comment. That's right. It does. It lives in the comments. Uh, so, from our last episode about North Star, which was the Old West episode we were just talking about, there was one comment from Eboss that said, Enterprise sure was a little bit schizophrenic from time to time when it came down to episode topics and flavors. Yes. North Star was just a fun one not too much to think about. And it was lovely to see the actors having fun and getting out and about. Also, it isn't a wiki summary without the license plate NX01 mentioned. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Good video as always. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was really funny. And then there was a series of two comments that I think were a good kind of back to back. But the first one is from, I'm going to hopefully not butcher his name, Stefan Vasila Yonita. All he wrote was, the episode North Star is very good, but you guys don't see the good perspective. I would illuminate you guys, mm. but he didn't illuminate us. Right. I want to be illuminated. <laughs> so right. Stefan, if you hear this, <laughs> yeah, add, add a comment and explain what we missed. Cause I would love to hear your perspective on it. Yeah. The there Robo is a Trav, perspective to yeah. just jump in real quickly on yeah. that. I would like, I would just like to say, you know, Matt and I come to these episodes with for good or for bad our regular listeners will know the number of times that Matt and I have disagreed and like clashed over a response to an episode have not been as often as those episodes where we're fairly Insane. unified in our response to it. And that comes from the fact that Matt and I are practically clones a la this episode <laughs> in certain ways. And that's yeah. again, for good or for bad, you know, the, the I think the channel uh, works because of our ability to converse about these things in a, in a parlance that is, has a shorthand to it so that we're able to get into the nitty gritty of our conversations a little bit faster. The difficulty is that there is a perspective that Stefan may be reflecting, which is maybe you just want an adventure story. Maybe you just yeah. want to be entertained. Maybe you just want to see people on a spaceship 
flying around and doing stuff. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And if there is, if somebody like Stefan or any of our other listeners come to this and say like, boy, you really missed the boat of just having fun on horses. Yeah. Jump into the comments and let us know that that's what you think, because we want to have an engaging discussion, but we also do not come to this discussion with the attitude of we have spoken, therefore it is law. That's not what we're trying to do here. We really do appreciate Stefan, your comment, and we'd invite you to come back and give us some more details about what you're, what you're thinking. We'd revisit it. Well, on that point, Sean, there is a comment that kind of agrees with us and it's from RoboTrav. He said he really liked the part at the end where the sheriff was watching the lesson and raised his hand to see the picture. He seemed so humbled. He said he thought it was a good moment. Otherwise, he agrees that this is a rather odd episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he asked the same question I asked, where did all the horses come from? Yes. So it's, yeah. So it's like, it's definitely interesting to hear, you know, obviously there's people that agreed with us, but like you mentioned, if Stefan has a different point, viewpoint, I definitely want to hear it. And then related to today's episode, I thought this was a nice one from Miss Dana Fox. Uh, it was about the episode Twilight. Uh, wrote Archer and Paul's relationship is what kept me tuning in. Probably my favorite episode of Enterprise ever. Glad you guys like this one too. Yeah. And I want to relate that to this one because this episode, uh, for me, the relationship between T'Pol and the captain is one of my favorite parts of the series as well. Yeah. But I also love the relationship with Trip between yeah. Trip and T'Pol and Trip and, and the captain. So it's like there's interesting relationships there I like to see explored. And this episode man drives that home and there was so yeah. much in this episode i was getting a, getting a little weepy on so it's yeah. like I'm, I'm i really appreciate the character building the relationships between some of the key characters yeah i agree so that noise you're hearing in the background usually when matt's wrapping up the comments that alarm starts going off in the background and anybody who's confused by that alarm don't worry it's just the read alert it's time for matt to read the wikipedia description and matt don't blink or you'll miss this one. I I haven't even read it, but just the size of it, I'm going to tell you, I love this description already. <laughs> Similitude is the 10th episode from the third season of the television series Star Trek Enterprise. It first aired on November 19th, 2003, and was the 62nd episode of the series. Captain Archer orders a short-lived clone of Trip Tucker to be made in order to save Tucker. This is how all the descriptions <laughs> of Star Trek should be written. <laughs> Thank you, whoever wrote this for Wikipedia. Yeah. I <laughs> even excised some things from it because they weren't actually about within the episode summary. So there was an additional comment, which I'll get to later. But when I saw the length of this, I literally scrolled up and down on the page to make sure, am I <laughs> seeing it all? Is this it? Because how could that possibly, I don't know, Wikipedia, where did you go? <laughs> So as Matt just said, this is from season three. It's episode 10. It was directed by fan favorite LeVar Burton. When I saw that, it didn't surprise me. Like this really, I'm, I really have earned an appreciation for his directorial talents in spotting his name again and again in the way that we're watching the series and recognizing, wow, when it comes to interpersonal, when it comes to emotional depth, he's the guy who's involved in yep. a lot of those episodes. And I really, really liked it. This episode was written by Manny Cotto and Manny Cotto. I believe it's one of the first times we're seeing him as a writer on the series. He will go on to be a major hand in the final season of enterprise. He becomes an executive producer and showrunner of the show. And it's in its final season. He was also an executive producer on four seasons of 24 and he was an executive producer and writer for the fifth season of Dexter on Showtime. So this is a guy who has had his hand in a lot of different types of shows. He originally entered Hollywood and getting into entertainment through the sci-fi and fantasy lens. But clearly, he's a guy who knows how to hit a lot of beats across genre, 24, Dexter, Enterprise, those Three programs are not very similar in a lot of ways, but the storytelling in this one, I think demonstrates a really keen eye for strong storytelling as the relationships between the characters. It doesn't matter if they're on a spaceship, doesn't matter if they're working for the U S government, doesn't matter if they're a serial killer. Well, let me rephrase that. 
This episode also featured music by Velton Ray Bunch. I don't normally mention the music when we're talking about the synopsis, but I pointed out here because this episode won an Emmy for composition. So this, this episode was a strong attention getter from pretty much every perspective. The original air date was November 19th and guest appearances included Maximilian Orion Kasmodel, who played Sim Trip at four, Adam Taylor Gordon, who played Sim Trip at eight, and Shane Sweet, who played Sim Trip at 17. And what was the world like on November 19th, 2003, when this episode aired? Well, Matt, you were still dancing your little heart out to Here Without You by Three Doors Down, a song <laughs> which if you put a gun to my head and asked me to sing it, I would be a dead man. And at the movies, people were showing up to see Elf, which earned $26 million in the theaters this week as a pre-Thanksgiving film. And little fun fact, Matt, I don't know if you know this, our mother refused to see Elf for years. Yep. I recommended to her once, you should see Elf. It is really in your wheelhouse. This is your kind of movie. And she said, no, no, I refuse to see it because I do not like Will Ferrell. And I said, why don't you like Will Ferrell? And she said, because he's so dirty. And I said, really? You think he's dirty? Why do you think he's dirty? And she said, well, ever since I saw The 40-Year-Old Virgin, I thought, <laughs> I'll never see another Will Ferrell movie, which I thought was interesting because Will Ferrell is not in The 40-Year-Old Virgin. <laughs> so thank you, Steve Carell, for making our mother hate Will Ferrell. <laughs> and on television, on this day, the 19th of November, what were people watching? Well, unfortunately, they really weren't watching Enterprise. 4.6 million viewers tuned in for Enterprise, whereas 6.4 million viewers showed up for Smallville, proving once again that Smallville is the perfect inverse of Enterprise. 9.5 million showed up for Ed. That 70s show and that 70s show on Fox, back to back episodes, were getting almost 10 million viewers. 10 million viewers were showing up for 60 minutes to Electric Boogaloo, which was talking about, among other things, human growth hormone for children, General Wesley Clark discussing his presidential campaign. And the last time I mentioned Wesley Clark to my girlfriend, I said, Do you remember Wesley Clark? And she just said, Yes, he was hot. So. Okay. There we go. And 12 Last million viewers were showing up for my <laughs> wife and kids and 10 million for it's all relative. <laughs> and in the news, I wanted to go a little bit wider on the news scope in this one main story in the New York times on this day revolved around victims, families response to plans to rebuild the world trade center after the nine 11 attacks in 2001, Glenn Collins wrote victims, families yearned to touch the bedrock where the world trade center stood. Firefighters had to see their buddies' names listed together. Artists dreamed of a revelation, the fiercely protective hope for an expression of the essential horror of the tragedy and the spirit of what the city endured. And there were multiple versions of a replacement building at the World Trade Center, and all of them were viewed as either inappropriate or boring. So that was part of the long debate about what kind of tower and what kind of memorial would replace the lost Twin Towers. Other headlines included a chess champion and a computer coming to a draw for the first time. Britain's fearing that their Prime Minister Blair was too much in President Bush's wake, and Michael Jackson had been arrested on child molestation charges. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the year 2003 and what it meant for cloning. The episode we're going to talk about revolves around a clone, and I kept thinking there's something about this that just seems too perfect. So I did a little digging, and I dug up some information about Dolly the Sheep. I don't know if any of our listeners will remember Dolly. But Dolly was a female Finnish Dorset sheep, and she was the first mammal cloned from an adult somatic cell. She was cloned by associates of the Roslyn Institute in Scotland using the process of nuclear transfer from a cell taken from a mammary gland. She was named after Dolly Parton. I will let that sink in. She yep. was named after Dolly Parton. She was cloned from a mammary gland. Don't tell me the Scots don't have a sense of humor. Yeah. Her cloning proved that a cloned organism could be produced from a mature cell from a specific body part. 
Contrary to popular belief, she was not the first animal to be cloned. The employment of adult somatic cells in lieu of embryonic stem cells for cloning emerged from the foundational work of John Gurdon, who cloned African clawed frogs in 1958 with his approach. The successful cloning of Dolly led to widespread advancement within stem cell research, including the discovery of induced pluripotent stem cells. So what we're talking about was a major breakthrough. The stem cell research here that led to Dolly, stem cell research was involved in creating the vaccine mm -hmm. for COVID-19. So it's an interesting line to draw from we've cloned a sheep in Scotland to we're helping to fight a global pandemic. It's an interesting line. And I think it's an important one to remember that this kind of research isn't about, well, we need more sheep. It's doing something else. It is looking at what can we do with a cell from an organism, regardless of where that cell came from, what part of the body can we actually duplicate it? And they managed to do it. Dolly lived at the Rosalind Institute throughout her entire life. She produced several lambs and she was euthanized at the age of six due to a progressive lung disease. Research into the cause of her lung disease could not find a relationship to her cloning. So her lung disease may have simply been the result of the fact that all of the researchers smoked like chimneys around her. We do not know. <laughs> Dolly's body has been preserved and was donated to the Rosalind Institute in Scotland by the Rosalind Institute in Scotland to the National Museum of Scotland, where it has been regularly exhibited since 2003. So she was euthanized at the beginning of the year in 2003. And here we are at the end of the year 2003 with an episode about a clone. And I can't help but wonder, was the presence of Dolly's end of life in the news part of spurring on the idea of doing an episode like this. I don't think it seems too far fetched to think that that might've played a part. Yeah. It may have played a part. So as for the episode, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not crazy about bookend storytelling where you start off and you show something and then you say dot, dot, dot two weeks earlier, two weeks <laughs> earlier. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big fan of you start where the story starts. That's what I try and do in my own writing. That's what I like to see unless there is a very strong cause for, for doing it the alternative way in this episode, it is very much a gotcha sort of book ending, which I think is a weak starting point because what they want you to do is feel hooked by the fact that they are holding a funeral aboard the enterprise. And when they lower the camera to show us who is being eulogized it is trip in we have all grown very accustomed to burial practices in the star trek universe you grab your nearest photon torpedo tube you put your body <laughs> in that and then you release the the photon torpedo into space and so we see that again here we see trip in memoriam we see the entire crew talking about him the captain is eulogizing him very movingly of his loss has led not only to the survival of this ship and its crew, but to all of humanity potentially. And then they would go to the opening credits. So what did you think about this as a hook at the beginning of the episode? So you might, I might be on different pages on this one. I, I gen in general agree with you. I don't like the book ending of you show something from the end and then you go to the beginning it sometimes feels like a cheat. However, from the point of view of you got to grab a viewer by the throat right at the beginning to get them to go, what the, and mm -hmm. we'll keep watching. And the reason I feel that way is I make YouTube videos and you have to grab people right at the beginning, get their attention and go, please watch this. And then go back <laughs> and start explaining it. So yeah. for me, what I actually wrote in my notes was good opening hook because mm -hmm. Holy cow, it gets your attention in the first 30 seconds of this episode. They're showing you a dead trip, one of everybody's favorite characters. And it's, it makes you go, what happened? And so it makes you want to find out more. So it's like, mm -hmm. I, in general, I agree with you that I don't like that as a storytelling technique. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about you're vying to get as many people to watch this episode as you possibly can, and you have seconds to get their attention. I thought this was actually a really good approach because mm -hmm. in general, this episode I'm not going to talk about everything, but like 
there's not a lot of plot or action in this. This is a classic Trek ethical dilemma. Lots of people sitting around talking about stuff, but it's gripping drama. Yeah. And so it's like, you, you got to get people's attention right up front of you're going to want to watch this because we're going to be tackling with something that's going to be kind of emotional trips dead. And so yeah. it's like, you want to watch it. So it's like, I, I kind of forgive them for using that technique because I think it was something they kind of felt like they had to do to try to get people's attention. Right. I, I felt like there was another starting point to the episode that would have, for me, offered as much of a hook as much of an insight into the ethical dilemma of what the episode was going to be about would have been as effective and would have given more room for some of the post clone creation storytelling, which mm -hmm. is really for me where the heart of this episode took place. There's stuff at the beginning yeah. of this episode, the opening hook being the burial scene, and then some scenes where you see to Paul and trip in their, now very clearly regular massage therapy sessions, which I actually really liked that episode, that scene in this one particular, mm -hmm. because I felt like it demonstrated they had the awkwardness is now completely gone. They've shown the evolution of that part of their relationship that the two of them come together and they're touching bodies, squeezing body parts, doing all sorts of stuff. And the most that they're getting out of it is to Paul is like, Oh, that's too hard. Don't do it that hard. So it's, I thought that was a nice evolution to showing how this has become a part of their day and they are talking shop while they're doing it. They've clearly yep. like gotten past any level of awkwardness and this has become a, a sort of cherished ritual that they are yep. exhibiting. I thought that was the part of the opening 10 minutes, 15 minutes of this episode. That was the one part that I was just like, okay, that's worth keeping. But I thought there was an alternate way of starting the episode, which would have, you didn't need, except for action purposes, you didn't need to show the accident. You didn't need to show the warp core test. It was, it was from a certain perspective, interesting and it was gripping, but ultimately you didn't need it to tell the story that they told by the, the last two thirds of the episode. I think you could have started this very strongly showing Dr. Phlox caring for a baby and talking lovingly to the baby. And what are we going to name you? That scene to me could have been a great opening to then pull back and he's trying to name the baby. And if they had had a moment with Archer standing there saying, why are you trying to name it? We know what it's for. And then you pull the camera back and you should trip in the bed with the electrodes on his head and he's in a coma. I think that could have been as compelling a starting point because then you could just yada, yada, yada. He was injured by an explosion in the engineering section. And then you would have had more room within the episode for more exploration of the interpersonal stuff. Having said that, my entire reason for suggesting all of that is simply because I tend not to like bookend storytelling. Right. I right. think if you have bookend storytelling, this episode does it about as well as you could. Mm -hmm. it doesn't do one thing that I think is usually the best form of bookend storytelling. It didn't make you forget what the opening was. Yeah. You go through yep. this entire episode knowing that the, you watch this entire thing, knowing it was a gotcha opening, you know how this episode is going to end. So well, here's, here's, no problem the there. I, on that note, the one thing I thought of as we were watching the episode, as I was watching the episode, the, at one point in the episode, Sim as he's called trips yeah. clone um when he gets to a point where he discovers just as a quick synopsis there's this thing from some planet that if you inject it with dna from whatever the host is it'll basically create a clone of that thing right and so flox basically injects dna from trip into this thing and then voila you have this fast growing uh sim that will take 15 days from birth to death and they can harvest organs from it so it's a really interesting ethical dilemma, uh, but somewhere along those lines where Sim finds out that there is research that shows there's a certain enzyme that you can give one of these clones that will slow down their growth to what would be a normal amount of growth. So in theory, you could start giving Sim enzyme injections every day and right. he would age like a normal trip. 
I think they could have leaned more heavily into that element. Yeah. Because then it would have created a fork of like, as a viewer, wait, which one was in that? Which one was that? Yeah. Which one was the one that died? Was it Sim or was it, was it actually the real Tucker? Did he actually die? Did Trip actually die? And the new one that we're going to have is actually the Sim. Because like, as I'm watching it, I had forgotten that that was even a plot line. Yeah. I, I remember, but even as I'm watching this, it's like, it never was in my mind of even a remote possibility they were going to do that. Yeah. Because that would be a ballsy move. But I thought, wouldn't it have been awesome if they had done that? It would have been so cool that yeah. you would have this new trip, who's the old trip, but a new trip. And it would have created this whole dynamic that would have been really interesting to go down that path. But you know, they're never going to be that that ballsy and and take that shot. So it's... I agree with you. It's it never at any point that I forget that yeah. that's going to be the sim in the in the box. It's like it, I never thought anything otherwise. And because of that, it did kind of weaken the impact of having that cold open. I really like your suggestion of like if you incorporated my suggestion of you start post accident, you just start with trip in a in the bed in the in the sick bay. He was severely injured. It's a brain injury, but I think we can fix it because we were able to create this clone using that thing just yada, yada, yada your way through it. And then you have more time when Trip on his own, when Sim discovers, oh, there's this enzyme potentially. And what if Sim entailed to Paul in helping conduct research in that vein and she yeah. thinks she might find a breakthrough? Then you end up with them on their personal level. Like he exposes his growing romantic feelings for yep. to Paul this is a key element for the rest of the series where that door is now, it, it was always like cracked open. This character literally goes and just pushes it open. And he's like, I can't think about anything but you in what I think is a very, there's a great moment where he says, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, but I feel like this is so important. I have to share this with you. And I really liked the framing of, I'm not sure if I'm feeling this way because it's just me or if I'm tapping into long-term memories and feelings of yeah. trip, I don't know which this is. There is a terrific sequence to the storytelling showing younger trip, younger Sim, who as you can memories tell, are unlocking. Yeah. Right from yeah. the beginning, he has feelings for, but the way his memories are unlocking as he gets older is done in such a loving way toward the character. It's not meant to be horrific for this child that he's suddenly like, where are my parents? He's turning to people that on a certain level he views as parental figures. He turns to captain Archer and says, where are my parents? And it's clear this child trusts the captain. There is something about this evolving being that is trusting and loved by the crew. The episode ends with an incredibly loving, moving connection between Phlox and Sim. Oh man. Where, can, can yeah, it gets you right in the feels when he I says just, to him, like, yeah. you were a great father. And I would have liked, again, if my version of introduction to this, this episode took place, you could have had more parenting. You could have shown Flocks raising him more, which would have made that gut punch all the more guttier. It could have been. Yeah. It could so have there's, really, really hit you. Can I just add to that? There, there's yeah. two lines in the episode that got me right here. I was like, I was on the verge of weeping a little bit. It was the line, I don't know if they're my feelings or his when he's talking to Paul. Yeah. It was such a wonderful, tender moment. It was like, oh my God. And her reaction to those words, like, once again, I will say I love Jolene Blaylock's performance as yeah. to Paul. I think she's phenomenal. And that scene was just one of those moments of like, this is why I love her as that character. Um, and then the moment when he says to Phlox, you've been a, like a father to me. Yeah. was just like somebody just came into the room and punched me in the stomach. And it was yeah. just like, oh, that's such a, oh my God. But it felt like another missed opportunity to me because they showed him raising Sim the yeah. like in a, in a montage for, the, yeah. the, for like a three minute sequence. But it would have been great if they had a couple of additional moments where Sim and these moments of like when he has that argument with 
the captain about you don't you're just gonna kill me you're right. like you're, you're sentencing me to death and the captain says i would do anything to save him basically he basically threatens sam like yeah. you're gonna do this i'm gonna force you to do this it would have been great if the next scene was him going to his father going yeah. to fox and basically just unloading and looking to him for help and like why aren't you helping me with this yeah and like you could have had this wonderful tender yeah. moment between the two of them and a challenging moment too. That. It could have been a challenging yes. moment of like, why did you create me to die? How is this and ethical? Flocks every time from the very moment when he suggests this to the captain with this like little like <laughs> albino, like squishy sponge. When he says to the captain, I can do this. From the very moment, Flox has this, the performance looks like he's really questioning if he should even bring this up. Yeah. He looks he looks like he's grappling with the ethical dilemma for this before he even suggests the problem. Yeah. And he looks clearly emotionally wrought over the entire episode. So if you had a moment like that, Fox could have been left basically bawling by himself in the, the <laughs> <right>? <laughs> in the emergency room area. So it's like you could, it would have been, it would have made the line when he says, you're being like a father to me. It would have made it from a, I almost wept to a, I would have been bawling like a baby moment. Yeah. So it's like, it felt like a slightly missed opportunity, but you can understand why when you think about the entire episode, why they structured it the way they did. You can yeah. understand why they did the scenes they did. So it's like, I'm not trying to rewrite it to make it a better script. I'm just kind of, from my perspective, seeing these kind of gaps where they could have maybe yeah. strengthened those emotional beats. Yeah, I feel like in this one, this is not us putting on a rewriter hat, which we have clearly no. done many times in this <laughs> podcast. Uh, I feel like I'm putting on my fan fiction hat. There are yeah. scenes that I think could exist in my own canon about this episode those yep. moments you mentioned uh to paul julian blaylock fantastic job in this episode at the beginning her interactions with sim are clearly about avoidance she does yep. not like being reminded that trip is in sick bay and potentially will pass she cannot really interact with this individual because she's too reminded by sim of trip but once she is forced to interact, their interactions then become one where every time she's on camera, T'Pol is about to cry. Yes. Every single time. It looks like Jillian Blaylock probably spent a couple of minutes before each shot not blinking so that the entire time <laughs> she is looking at <laughs> Trip, her eyes are full of tears in every single one. And it's clear that she is wrestling with her absolute fear of losing trip they had that episode they had that scene i mentioned previous of showing the two of them having their massage therapy ritual i think that the way that this conversation takes place between sim and her where he reveals her feelings and then she reciprocates by the end of the episode coming to see him when he is now like i'm gonna go die now and he yeah. is sitting in the cabin which I really like the scene where the captain finds Sim in Trip's cabin and is offended. Like the captain in this one, the moral dilemma, the ethical dilemma of this episode in Archer's choices, his willingness to create a life to end that life is never really resolved. There is no mm. winner here. And that's remarkable from a storytelling perspective. They manage to make you leave the episode still willing to like characters who have done things that are really questionable. Yes. Archer pushes back on Sim having any right to being in Trip's quarters. Sim is making a very strong argument of I am Trip. Yep. You are creating a separation that doesn't exist. But at the end, he is now allowed in that in those quarters, he is hanging out in those corners, spending his last hours hanging out with Archer's dog. I thought that that was symbolically <laughs> a lovely depiction of Archer has yes. un Archer understands more yes. about who he is dealing with. And Archer is on a certain level, uh, caving on caving inward. He, he feels terrible about what he has done. And it's hard to say at the end of the episode that Archer, if he could go back and remake decisions, would he make the same decisions? I do not know. But at the very end, when T'Pol shows up outside the door, it doesn't say a word and simply kisses 
sim, then you as a viewer, I thought that that was such a powerful way to say like, yeah, this is, this is where their relationship is headed. Yep. This is a, this is a shortcut to that in a way, but it makes sense. She is in safe territory with somebody who is literally going to go die. Now she's in safe yes. territory to say, I can reveal myself to you in this way. And I need to, because you are as much that individual I love as he is. So she yeah. reaches a logical conclusion of it is okay for me to let you know that I love you because it is finite in this moment. She's not yet ready to tell the original trip, but she can tell this one. I thought that was really fantastic. I also want to play, pay a, a compliment to the show's exceptional, efficient storytelling because there are moments and there are ways that they, through the cinematography, through the special effects, and through a couple of key moments, they are able to communicate sometimes on a subconscious level, sometimes on a very on, on the nose level, but they're very efficient in d detailing the issues. Cause we haven't talked about the plot of how the, the ship is trapped in this like weird nebula where there's basically this magnetic yeah. uh, stuff collecting on the outside of the ship. And if they don't get out, it's a ticking clock. So if they don't get out of there at a certain moment, they're going to basically be dead, stranded and they'll all die. Yeah. So there's this wonderful bit of just like, I, I don't know whose idea it was, whether it was the writers or whether it was LeVar Burton's or whoever's, it, I thought it was wonderful. The windows, it was just the yeah. windows because you can see the stuff collecting on the ship. And the beginning of the episode is just like, like little, like, like splotches of snow hitting a windshield. And then halfway in, it's kind of like somebody needs to run the wipers. It's getting kind of <laughs> thick. And then by the end, it's like, it feels oppressive yeah. because it's so thick. Like the captor's captain's cabin, his, his cabin looks dark and kind of foreboding because yeah. it's so coded and it was like just that element of the cinematography and filmmaking was like such a brilliant way to kind yeah. of remind you uh, without anybody going hey look at all that stuff collecting on the window yeah. it's just in the background yeah and you as a viewer are just subconsciously picking up on the oh crap oh crap it's yeah. getting worse oh crap um i love that and to tie back to the captain's horrible reaction of like i'm gonna kill you because yeah. we gotta save trip to the simplicity of Porthos being in the cabin with him and he's petting him. It just that without anybody saying a freaking word, yeah. you know, the captain has kind of turned a corner. He's kind of realized what he is yeah. and he is supporting him because Porthos, the support pup is yeah. there on his lap getting pet. And it was just a wonderful tender moment. And so, and the kiss, it's like, there were so many little elements like that, that are subtle but they say so much without yeah. a word being spoken. So yeah. it's like, if you can't tell, I love this episode. Yeah, I think I this is great. one of the, one of the better written episodes. I think it's one of the better performances of episodes. You mentioned how it won an Emmy for, you know, the composition. This to me feels like this could have been an uh, Emmy winning episode for acting, writing, yeah. everything. So it's All like, the this actors is one in of the terrific. episodes. I thought that yeah. not only were the main actors in the episode terrific, Bacula, Blaylock, Trip, Flox, like they're all fantastic. But the child actors playing younger Sim, the mm -hmm. the one who plays the the youngest version of him, the 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 one who flies the remote controlled aircraft, that little actor does a tremendous job with like, I am connecting to you as a father figure. And I'm wondering why I have memories that take place in other places. I have memories that are showing up about people who are not here. Where are my parents? The, the conflict that he is able to demonstrate in that moment is terrific. And that scene also included one of my favorite things. And it was clearly a blooper, but it's left in they're flying the remote controlled craft. It crashes on the ground in the, cargo room I I where say. they are <laughs> yeah young sim and archer converge on it in order to see if it can be repaired and porthos walks up <laughs> and clearly stands Stand on, on the remote on controlled it. aircraft because suddenly his little butt is up in the shot and bacula <laughs> without missing a beat simply pats the dog and pushes him off of this thing that is not even on camera but in that moment i was just like what a great tender moment and what a terrific moment that that dog decided I'm going to stand on this because this is where the people are. Yeah. <laughs> so listeners, viewers, 
Uh, what did you think about this episode? Do you agree that this is one that gets you right in the feel parts of your body? The, the, does it hit you square in the gut with a emotional gut punch or did you find it a little too quiet for your taste? Let us know in the comments. As usual, you can find the contact information in the podcast description or on YouTube. You can go beneath this video of our smiling faces and leave a comment there. And next time, Matt, we're going to be talking about the episode Carpenter Street. Any expectations there about what we're going to be talking about? Uh, I'm going to guess the trip and the captain start doing some woodworking. I think so. I think that's what they're yeah. doing. Yep. Before we go, as usual, we like to remind people about other things we've got going on. For me, you can always go to seanforherald.com or you can go to your local bookstore or you can go to Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, wherever you get your books. You can find my books there. Keep an eye out as we move forward through time, time, time for my book that will be coming out next year, which is The Sinister Secrets of Singe. It is a book for middle grade readers, but I hope that adults will enjoy it as well. Matt, what do you have coming up next week on your channel? Well, at the time that this video is probably going to come out, the video that's going to be live on Undecided is about solar panel recycling because 90% of solar panels here in the United States are not recycled. They're just chucked into a dump. So what can we do about that? Is it something mm -hmm. we need to be concerned about? So I have a video exploring that. Knee jerk reaction. I'm going to say yes, we should be concerned about that. Yes. Yeah. Don't forget, if you'd like to support the show, you can review us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it was you found this, go back there and you can give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, click on the become a supporter button, and you can throw some coins at our heads. We appreciate the welts. And when you do that, it also gains you access to our out of time program in which we talk about things that are not necessarily a part of this cohesive timeline of episodes. So we might talk about other Star Trek programs. We might talk about Star Wars, Marvel, whatever catches our eye. More recently, we've talked a little bit about the Sandman program on Netflix. We've yep. also talked about a few movies we've been checking out. So when you sign up to become a supporter, you become a cadet and you get access to Out of Time. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thank you so much for your reviews, for your feedback. All of that really does help support the show. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye.